Great, Bud, thanks very much. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can see that. Uh, let's see. So Mads Torgerson was thinking of joining, but uh, he can't. Now, uh, you, you will, some of you will know, or all of you may know Mads as the design lead on C Sharp for about the last five versions, about half of it. I think he's almost a majority designer on C Sharp now. And uh, so, but he did send some feedback, uh, roughly saying, you're doing the right thing. And, and uh, it's in the right direction, I guess, is what he was saying. In particular, that's relevant because um, Mads spent a long time trying to find a way to make tasks and similar such um, resumable code kind of things uh, be, be definable by one general mechanism in C Sharp and was never able to quite land that. And so at the C-sharp ended up with the hard wiring the implementation of tasks and task and, and async enumerables. And uh, so I think in a way we, we are achieving what Matt's had been trying to achieve. Uh, so I'm glad to get his particular feedback. OK, so um, this is community design, implementation and test review. Uh, maybe it's part one. We might need a part two on this. Uh, and on resumable code and tasks. Now, this is not a talk, okay? For those who are new to this topic, or are, you know, your F Sharp users, uh, uh, this is not a talk where I'm advocating the feature. I'm not, you know, if you if you get, if you give a talk about a feature, you tend to focus on how simple it is to use, and here's all the nice things you can do with it, and you know, isn't this the end experience is actually nice and simple to use, uh, but the, this is not what we're doing today. We have to look under the hood. We have to look for the complexity, and I want you to be thinking about what can go wrong with with, with that, okay? What can, what can, you know, your critical hat from a design perspective, implementation perspective, testing perspective, and on the testing perspective, it's worth uh, keep asking yourself the question of like of if I implemented this, what mistakes would I make? Okay. And what testing would I want to have done? And so uh, we, we don't have to cover all your feedback on that regard today. Uh, but you know, don't be shy <laughs> to say, have you tested this? Have you tested this? This interaction. Okay. Uh, because we, there's a thing I, an image I like to use, which is that having one person look at a design, especially a design with any complexity, like puts a a, a, a grid down, okay, in one direction, okay. But having another person puts it layers another grid over the top in a different direction, and then a third person layers another grid over the top in another direction. And sooner or later, you've got no holes in the design, or only really, really tiny holes. And so we need different perspectives and uh, looking at this kind of feature. So please be aware you come from a different perspective and that's a good thing, we want that. But I'm going to mostly give my perspective, but I want your, you looking at this too. Okay, so we will look over four RFCs. I will talk about a sample of uh, doing co-routines. Uh, we'll look at some very basic coding with tasks. We'll look at the task builder's use of SRTP for tasks. Uh, I, the general assumption is, here, you, is you all know F Sharp, okay? And you all actually even know the F Sharp implementation and the F Sharp code base. So if this is your first time in the F Sharp world, don't, uh, you know, this, we are making those assumptions. <clears throat> uh, we will look through the implementation as three main files, lower state machines, RLX, gen, and tasks, and then we will take a, a walk through the proofing and testing and hopefully wrap up in about an hour, a little bit over an hour, hour and a half. And um, that this should give you enough that you can go and do an in-depth review uh, at, on testing and on the code. Uh, okay, so let's take a look at the RFCs. And this is the RFCs here. <clears throat> okay, so 
I have covered a separate talk on uh, on the notion of resumable code uh, and uh, the first design iteration of that uh, in a compiler session. Uh, so I'm going to be assuming most of the people on the call were on that, and so it won't be completely new. Okay. So uh, the high level aim is to very minimally add support for a task builder uh, to F sharp. Uh, that is going to allow us to do the usual kinds of programming uh, with a builder, very much like the async type. Now the task type differs from the async type in F sharp in some crucial ways. First of all, it builds a task of T value. Secondly, it starts executing immediately okay, on the current thread as soon as you execute this expression. Uh, thirdly, it does not pass cancellation tokens automatically through the computation. You've got to pass those uh, yourself. You like you'll be, have a function which takes the cancellation token explicitly. And it also doesn't check cancellation tokens. Okay. But the fact that it can start immediately on the current thread means it is can be implemented very, very efficiently. Okay, uh, and in particular, you you don't even have to allocate anything except on the stack to, in some sense, logically speaking, start executing a, a task. And this is this is really different from async. Async is nicer in some ways. It's uh, got a sort of better definition about where code runs. You know, you can build up a big async and then say, run this whole thing in the background, please. And then you know that the whole async will run on the back in the thread build. Tasks aren't like that. Tasks start running straight away. And that is important. A async is really nice with its cancellation tokens, and async also supports tail calls. In async, task doesn't do that. The task is different. But in some, but uh, what you can do inside tasks is very similar. You can bind to things, you can bind to other tasks, uh, and you can have nested tasks, for example. You can do a try with here, and you can await various things such as a delay. And then once you hit an await point, you uh, of course have to actually allocate, and then the, the, the task becomes a real thing and the rest of the code it becomes an allocated object and the rest of the code will uh, run uh, when the resumption happens. Okay. All right. So, 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 so. Okay. So, that's tasks. <clears throat> so, what's the mechanism we're going to use to build tasks? And the mechanism is resum resumable code. Okay. And, uh, the um, so the, the the high level one of the high level principles is there are other things that have this resumable code property this uh, where code can wait besides tasks okay so there are also task sequences. And let me uh, async enumerables, and there are also coroutines, and there are other variations on these. And I will actually bring up the uh, some other motivating examples for that, so we can see what these things look like. So this is from the pull request from the feature tasks branch, which we're talking about today. I'll skip over the implementation and run down to uh, run down to a sample. Okay, so this is a I async enumerable. Okay, so it is can yield values. Yeah, and it can wait on tasks with let bound bang here, and then yield another value, and it can do another task, and that task might await. Okay, so the whole thing is yielding values, but is yielding them asyn asynchronously, and this implements the iasync enumerable in F sharp, and I've called it task seek. Okay, so we all, we, people have been using async seek for this sort of thing, so it's kind of logical to call this thing task seek. Okay, uh, it's, uh, it's not a sequence of tasks, but it's a sequence of results which can uh, give results asynchronously. Uh, 
I don't totally like the name, but we'll just stick with that name for now, because this RFC is not about task seek, but it is about the mechanism which we can use to build task seek, which is resumable code. Task seek is like task uh, in that it will start, uh, it's not that it will start immediately, it will actually start when you first iterate it. It's like I enumerate, I enumerable and I and, uh, get enumerated. So when you get an asynchronous enumerator for a task week, it's task seek, that's when it will start running. Okay, so <coughs> its execution semantics are a little bit uh, different to task in that it's cold start and, and you can run it multiple times. You can get multiple different enum enumerators for the one in async enumerable thing. Uh, okay, so that's another example of the sort of thing we want to build. Just to use a third motivating example, uh, we will look at Coroutines. Now, uh, we'll come back to these quite a lot. Okay. And I'm not advocating to put coroutines into F sharp core. Uh, it, they're more because actually coroutines are like imperative hell in a way. Okay. Because they don't return a result. There's, no, there's nothing functional about them at all. They're just like uh, a, a, a thing that can run and then it can yield up execution at some particular point and then it can resume and then it can yield and then it can re resume and we can yield to another coroutine which is like having a stack of them and and uh and on we go but the point is it does have these yield points now it's a very useful base level uh, example of resumable code uh, you could say resumable code and coroutines are almost exactly the same thing uh, except with resumable code, you can get them to do more as well, like we did tasks and task sequences. So coroutines are the sort of no-op of what you do with resumable code. They're the easiest thing to build with resumable code. And uh, now we're not going to put these into F sharp core because they're so, so imperative. They don't belong in a functional programming language, but you can build it from the outside if you happen to have particular use cases. Uh, for for where this is really really necessary. Uh, chat, let me know if there are questions at all along the way, and I'll actually pop up the comment chat as well. Free, if everyone, feel free to use the comment uh, chat on the in the meeting to to ask, to pop in questions uh, and to you know, raise points. Raise your hand to say anything along the way. Okay, coroutines are also a very good sample because they let you look at different dimensions of uh, the, the, the space of um, possibilities of what you can build with resumable code. We've already looked at some dimensions. We've looked at tasks, which I said were hot start. They start straight away and they return a value eventually. They have, uh, they bind to uh, tasks and we also will get them to bind to asyncs and other things as well. Uh, and they said they don't support tail calls. Okay, so in this set now, trying to modify tasks to do extra things can be a bit complicated. So it's quite useful to go and modify coroutines to do to do you know they're there to do the very, to do the basic thing. So in this case, we also I also modified coroutines to do tail calls. So for example, you can see this test tail call thing here, which says actually uses return bang as the tail call kind of instruction in the computation expression. And it is, we set n to be something like uh, a million down here. And so in this test tail call one here, this this had better be a tail call in the sense that it uses finite stack and it uses finite heap. It, it give, it, it, if, even if it does an allocation, it gives up that allocation as we go along. Uh, and in this sample in coroutine.fs, we look at adding adding um, tail calls into resumable code to check that we can use resumable code to build not only coroutines, but coroutines which do tail calls. Okay, and you can see how that sample plays out. Uh, we'll look at the implementation in a bit. Uh, but the important thing here, this is a guiding, you know, sample of the sort of thing we want to be able to build once we have resumable code. Okay, so I am going to We'll look at some basics of resumable code. I will start by looking at resumable.fsi, 
actually know where is it? I will find it in the implementation. Yeah. Oops. So resume the lot FSI is a new file in F sharp.core. And I want us to start looking at this part, this type here, resumable code of T. Uh, so we uh, resumable code, the whole point is to have a compositional thing called resumable code, which you can put together and you get this code, which you can then jump into the middle of and resume. You can, you can, you, you've got these points in them called resumption points where once you compose up your resumable code, you uh, you get a um, uh, uh, the, the the core of a, a coroutine. Okay, the, the thing that you can jump into the middle of. And we're going to the, the the fragments of compositional resumable code, which are going to get reused by resumptions. They're going to get reused by tasks. They're going to get reused by task sequences, with or without tail calls, and all, and with or without hot start, and all the other variations you have on these on these things. Uh, is going to be this resumable code type. And it is, you might think, oh my God, why are we using a delegate? Okay, very, and the, the, the thing is that delegates are slightly more general than functions in F sharp because they can take a byref parameter, which other, which functions can't do in F sharp. And they, uh, and that's because of limitations in .NET generics, and it's not normal in a way to use virus in a first class way like this, but it is very good for resumable code because it means that we can create a state machine on the stack as a struct, and we can pass around at this pointer to it effectively. And we have these little compositional blocks here, which are, are compositional despite the fact that they're taking these virus parameters. Okay, so that explains resumable code. Now it's a special type in the F# -sharp compiler. It's known to the F# -sharp compiler, but there are combinators for combining these things. You can sequence uh, resumable code. You can delay it, and you'll notice the naming here is exactly the same as the computation expressions. This isn't a computation expression. There is no computation expression for resumable code. That is effectively coroutines, and um, and it. Uh, you can yield, but it doesn't give up a value. It just uh, pauses the, the resumable code. Now, you might say resumable code, why is it returning bool? Well, that is the, the, the indicator of whether the resumable code completed or not. If it returns true, then it completed. If it returns false, then it paused uh, at some point. And if it paused at some point, the assumption is that it, it wrote into the resumable state machine whereabouts that it paused. So let's take a look at what is a resumable state machine. Resumable state machine is just a struct here. There we go, it's a struct. And it carries some data, which is sort of the particular, what does coroutines need? What do tasks need? What does anything else need? And that data is mutable. It's a, it's a mutable struct. Uh, it's got a resumption point, which is the integer where we will go to amongst all the possible resumption points. It's got some dynamic info if it's needed being executed dynamically. We'll talk about that later. And it implements, the expectation is that it implements the iosync state machine type. And it will implement uh, this type as well, which just allows you to get out the resumption point and get out the data using a hack in .NET generics, which allows you to get things out of structs, uh, any struct that implements a resumable state machine, uh, and it implements an interface in a zero allocation way. That's why this, this interface is needed. Okay, so that is pretty much everything in resumable. Uh, we, we get various different combinators for these. Uh, and now you, now you've got to remember that resumable code has a different semantics to um, other code in F# -sharp because you're allowed to jump it, once you've composed it up and you get your final state machine, you're allowed to jump into the middle of it. And so these these combinators all have to be written very carefully, uh, but they uh, they do preserve this kind of common property 
of uh, if you give a semantics to resumable code, which it says I've got multiple entry points, multiple places you can jump into, and then you compose that up, then you get a bigger and bigger thing that has more and more entry points. And some of them are protected by try statements, uh, some of them are protected by, by some, some of them jump in the middle of a loop and so on. So all the all the resumption points kind of still logically exist. Uh, they're not represented in the type system. You just have this general resumable code thing. But yeah, logically, you have uh, a composition of code, and the, which is why we're using this kind of style. OK, I'll talk about state machines in a, in a moment. OK, so let's go back and look at coroutines. And let's look at coroutine basic. Uh, now, I, I really want to make three. The assumption is that no user will ever, almost no users will ever define resumable code. Okay, it's only for about a handful of things. It's worth it for doing this cleanly just for task and task sequence uh, because it factors it really nicely. Uh, it means that we have a one mechanism in the F# -sharp compiler. We have this uh, for expanding out resumable code. So, so on a, it's an important point there. You'll notice that all these combinators that we had, like that compose things up, like combine and delay, they're all inline. And so we're really using this inlining mechanism of the F# -sharp compiler to compose this resumable code and and flatten it out until we get a until we get our final thing that we put inside our state machine. Uh, okay, so users won't be writing resumable code there's there should only be like 10 or 20 builders computation expression builders that end up using resumable code at all okay right so let's take a look at defining a builder uh, and it's going to be the the basic one the super imperative one which is going to be coroutines here and coroutines here, so coroutine code is just resumable code carrying coroutine state machine data. And the co coroutine state machine data, I, I wanted to put something in there, so I chucked an ID in there, okay? But as I said, coroutines are the, the no-op of, of resumable code. Like, uh, so they, they don't put any interesting information into the, there's no interesting control information in the state machine data. There's no awaiters. There's no. Um, there's no nothing to write to or read from or anything. Uh, so that is our code. So we just instantiate our routine code. You might be wondering what is the second parameter? It's explained in the RFC. It's useful for for constraining how you compose together resumable code. But in this case, we we don't care. We could just make it unit everywhere. Okay, so in everything else, you just see we're instantiating the data type with coroutine state machine. So a coroutine state machine is just a resumable state machine carrying the same kind of data. And so it's just those types that you saw before. Okay, so let's take a look at um, the type of coroutines here. Okay, so it's we're going to we're actually going to allocate coroutines. We're not going to start them straight away, so they're going to be cold start. And because they're cold start, that means we have to allocate them. Uh, but so you you allocate them, and then the user manually starts them. Uh, the user the, they're very simple things. They've got a move next function. And they've got an is complete property. Okay, so they, uh, and let's take a look at the builder. Okay, so uh, coroutine code is just resumable code with that data type and so all of the builders things they're all going to be in line and they are just going to be pretty much the exact corresponding resumable code builder just in just flattening things out with this empty pretty much empty data so the um, the zero value for the empty else branch is just that combined combine while wow, wow. okay Okay, uh, now we, we do have one other one down here, which is yield bang. And here we write some explicit resumable code. This is up here. All of this is resumable code using the built in bits and pieces. In this case, I put yield from to say yield from another coroutine is uh, well, it's actually a while loop. 
which says it's a resumable code while loop, which says it's not completed, move next, is completed. Uh, if uh, if it is not completed, then, then do a yield. So do you do one yield for every yield of the other coroutine? Uh, and finally, finally, once we have all that, we can now build a state machine. Okay, so the for coroutines. And I said we have. Um, uh, now you might say, why do we need to build a state machine? Okay, we've got ourselves a state machine here. We, you might say we've got our uh, coroutine state machine type, but the problem is, is this thing is a struct. And it's a struct because we want this really lovely performance properties of these state machines, particularly for tasks where you can just create a single struct on the stack. You can step through it as many times as you like. And if it happens to complete, well, you actually, you can even just, if you're returning a value task, then you end up with no allocations at all. And so these state machines are actually mutable structs, which are very rare low level beasts in F sharp. You don't get them much except in super high performance code. So, uh, so and the problem with structs is that they can't capture anything. Okay, so what we, so what we want is we want a, a coroutine state machine with some extra fields filled in for any anything that's being caught in the in the by the environment, uh, being captured just being captured. But uh, we can't have that in F sharp. So we instead uh there is no object expression for structs uh, there's no closure capturing thing to build a struct and you can't subtype structs in .NET. so um so we create this somewhat complex really intrinsic thing in the language and what i want you to see when you see this state machine thing is first of all something that users very never use because it's all in a library like this Secondly, it is uh, it is saying make me a new struct type which captures any necessary variables, uh, and and puts them as fields, and it has three methods. It's how to implement the iAsync state machine move next, uh, so the move next, and then the set state machine, and then it runs once it's created that struct type, it then passes its address of that struct type. So all of this gives us a struct on the stack. We get an address for the struct type and we can do whatever we like with that struct. And you might say, well, that's a lot of code to get myself a tiny little three field struct, but that's what we have to do. OK, it's got its own move next method. So you can this is like the executor for the for the resumable code. It's uh, it ends up doing a code invoke. Uh, it all, nearly always starts with a resume at. It says go to the resumption point wherever we wherever it is. And uh, after it, uh, so this so this construct here is what makes it a resumable state machine. And it may jump into the middle of this code, okay? Because this code is resumable code, and it gets it, because everything's in line, it gets fully expanded out. So you've got to think of this part here as being the entire body of the resumable code, including while loops and try finalies and everything else that's there. And you can jump into the middle of that, uh, and uh, and the the RFC goes through what happens when you do that, and then in the end the code still returns a boolean value, uh, and we can test that boolean value to see whether the thing actually completed or not, reached the end, or did it await. Uh, so true means complete, and so if it completed, we 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 just use the resumption point to write into that, and we're done. OK, so you get your little struct with this semantics attached to the struct in its interfaces. And you can do what you like with it. And what this one actually does is allocates, immediately allocates a coroutine object. It sets the data field of the state machine in that coroutine. And it uh, wires up the thing so that it remembers, oh, it's got the, oh, the contents of this actually so this should be these two lines are actually the wrong way around I, di I didn't i added this line without adding a test for it but this uh you should set the machine first and then you should set the id field of the machine uh and then you have your coroutine and you're done okay 
Right, so that is how you create a state machine. And if you go back to resumable, that explains the rest of resumable.fsi, which is it is all about this um, state machine primitive here, which is just this only purpose is to say we need a new struct type based on resumable state machine with this carrying this kind of data with this kind of semantics attached and we're going to eliminate once we get ourselves a uh, that struct we're going to eliminate it and do something with it like start it or allocate and then save it away what, whatever we're going to do with that machine thing we can we do it in this after code excuse me and then the other bits are just the primitives for specifying resumable code, resume that, and resumable entry. And that is it. Okay, so having done that, oh, sorry, just to finish off with coroutine.fs, coroutine basic. So given all of that, we'll talk about dynamic implementations in a moment. But you can make yourself a builder and you can make coroutines and you can do your stuff with those coroutines. Okay. This one didn't have the tail call support built into the coroutines, uh, but it is the kind of hello world of, of using resumable code. Okay. So let's take a look at uh, the RFC. See and check what we've covered so far. Okay, so uh, let's go through the principles, and you should have seen that already. So, no new syntax added. We want statically composable, resumable code. There's no change to the F sharp metadata format. Everything we've used so far is sort of standard F sharp, with some of it especially known to the compiler. It's primarily a, pr a compiler feature. Uh, it's used to build tasks and other things. Uh, it is activated only in reflect in compiled code. And this is, you can give an alternative implementation of tasks for reflective executions, so that's for quotations or reflection calls. And that's what some of those ifs were that we'll, we'll come back to. And this is an important thing. Um, it's actually, it's actually quite uh, relevant to the comparison with the C sharp design as well. The, the C sharp design isn't like this. It is a definitely a statically compiled thing, and there is no corresponding reflective execution because you can't do quotations in C sharp. And and that and and there are some interesting problems in the C sharp world because of that, which is that C sharp libraries are using more and more code gen. And or they and sometimes they use reflection to do that, and sometimes they're using source generators. And one of the reasons why people now I've seen comments saying, "Well, we better shift to source generators because it's so damn hard to code gen tasks async in C sharp. In F sharp, it, you'll still have that choice. You can move to a source generator kind of macro code, uh, code generation if you like." But because you've got these reflective primitives, it's actually quite easy just to make quotations which you can uh, reflectively create tasks uh, uh, when you need them. So this is actually a significant thing, and, and the C-sharp world is hitting sort of the, the limits of the compilers doing so much for them statically that if they don't have a compiler, they're kind of stuck. It's not the same trade-off if we're careful in the F-sharp world. But the primary feature I've talked about so far is only activated in compiled code. OK, uh, this is a low level feature. There were lots of warnings get emitted when you start writing uh, ref, uh, resumable code. You gotta, they basically say you've got to know what you're doing. There probably are holes in the feature in the sense that not everything is well, the fully typed directory can write invalid uh, resumable code. And uh, that's uh, I'm OK with that. We want as many checks as possible, but it, it is like it's a bit like unverifiable code in F sharp. It's OK if it's unverifiable as long as it's pinned down what happens in that case. Only for highly skilled F sharp developers. Uh, and note that there's nothing here that we couldn't have done semantically. It's just that you get a lot better performance. You get these structs with the semantics attached. OK, OK. 
Okay, so I've covered this design. You've seen you've seen Resume More Code. You've seen Resume More Code combinators. Uh, you you can um, okay. Let's take a look at a couple of how these Resume More Code combinators are what they look like. So let's look in the FS here, just so you actually really know what's going on underneath. Uh, so let's take a look at. Um, a resumable code while loop here. So this is the okay. So then we're going to get a condition which is just a function. It's marked we're inlining and it's marked inline if lambda, which means this is always going to get inline whenever the condition is a, uh, actually a lambda expression, which it nearly always will be, which it always will be for computation expressions. And we have a body of resumable code block and we return some. Okay, so what is the while loop? Well, it is this, and the important thing here is this body here, and that you can jump straight into the middle of this body when you resume. And the um, uh, so it's just important to remember that <laughs> because you're going to skip the initialization of stack go. It's going to be false. Uh, it's going to be the zero initialization, and you're going to be in the middle of body, but it will eventually return a boolean uh, one way wherever any resumption point is kind of a valid place that it will eventually still produce the result. And then we save that away and we go back around the loop. Uh, and these combinators can be used in dynamic where the static com in situations where the static compilation fails and or isn't active. And in that case, it does this while dynamic, uh, which you can we'll get to get to later. OK, uh, so the combinator is a little bit more complex for exception handlers. You know, this try with still becomes a try with, but it, you're not allowed to jump into the middle of a with. OK, so the code for in, in the, the rules of .NET IL, you've got to think of this as sort of pseudocode for a .NET I, fragment of a .NET IL method, and you're not allowed to jump into the middle of a with in .NET IL, so it's actually saves the information away, saves the exception away, and then runs a catch handler here outside the try with. Uh, and um, you have to do that, and that's what the C-sharp compiler does uh, as well with um, try with. Uh, you can look at try finally here. Here it also has to use a try with because you're not allowed to jump into the final block. And if we use a try finally, then every time we resumed, we would execute the finally, which would be too often. Okay, so we, it's not a stack-based finally. It's a it's a finally that says we execute the finally when the computation is finished. Uh, so when we get a true here from the body, we are going to continue on and execute the. Um, uh, so that goes into stack fin, and if stack fin is true, so we actually finished the thing, then we call the compensation for the finally block. Okay. So you get, so these are tricky primitives to write. You've got to be very careful with them. They have to follow the rules of .NET IL uh, when you branch into the middle of methods. Uh, but they once you've written them, yeah, the great one of the things we've got here is that we can reuse them for different control structures. OK. Right. Um, so let's go back to the RFC. So we were showing one of the resumable code combinators. Uh, we also write out what are the rules for low level resumable code. So in each of these cases, this is low level resumable code. So we do have some checking. I've marked it in the implementations as resumable code start and end. And there's some rules here. Things like you can't uh, you you can't um, have resumable code in a with block and rules like this and uh, they are covered in this specifying low level resumable code and most of these rules are checked. Okay, I'll skip over those exact rules because uh, I covered some of them in the, in the discussion. Then the final part of resumable code is hosting in a state machine, which you've seen already. Uh, you can only host inside struct state machines. In the first version of this, you could host inside reference state machines, but you can now only in struct state machines. It's always the one type of state machine, resumable state machine. 
uh, that we do use a compiler to um, every time uh, to, to generate up versions of resumable state machine with extra fields for the closure fields. Okay, so resumable state machine is copied to a new internal struct type. The state variables are added and you fill in the iAsync state machine interface with these methods here, these two methods. Okay, now what, <clears throat> one of the problems we have is that uh, in the current implementation of the resumable code translation down to uh, kind of get rid of this construct in the compiler, we are uh, not, it doesn't always succeed. There are some constructs that fail to compile. And one is if you, the resumable code uses the let rec. Uh, and uh, I didn't use a let rec anywhere in here, but uh, this is, this is also the case for the other state machines we generate in the F-sharp compiler in sequence expressions. And we fail state machine compilation and we resort to a dynamic implementation for if you use a let rec. And uh, we've tried to lift that restriction, but we realized we had a bug in that. Uh, and we put the restriction back in just before release, when, which is important. So in this case, I haven't tried to lift that restriction. If we lift that restriction, we'll do it both for sequence expressions and resumable code. So the, so this is the main reason that we have to um, we have to say have this definition of what is a compilable state machine or not. Okay, and I'd rather not have this in the spec. Uh, it might be that we can now look at getting rid of this let rec restriction. But uh, at the moment, we do need this in the spec. Some state machines are not compilable, and, it, and then we say what happens with those executional non-compilable state machines. Uh, you do get a warning if a state machine was not compilable, uh, and it's a late warning in the compiler. It doesn't come out in the, when you're working in the IDE, but it comes out once all the code's expanded, and and it sees that uh, a state machine wasn't compilable. But I think this is an acceptable uh, point, design point uh, as things stand today, given that this restriction already exists. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Uh, and then the rest of the spec is just saying how things actually execute and then running through the library editions that you've already seen. Uh, you've all you've seen all of this, and there's nothing um, nothing in there. Uh, th this belongs in a separate RFC. Uh, it's not related at all, and I should have carved it out before we did this design review. I'll pop that in a separate RFC. Okay, right. So that is resumable code. We can pop back to the coroutine sample. I will show you. Um, I will show you adding tail calls just to say, see how you how the variations on resumable code start to play out. And this is coroutines with tail calls. It's very similar to the uh, the previous one, except we each coroutine might have been hijacked, or you could say if it's if the coroutine has taken a tail call. This is what it tail called to. So it's got the tail call target. You don't have to think of it as a hijack target. You say it's a tail call target. And it's normally none, but it might have you might have tail called to a different coroutine. And uh, if now this comes in in this sort of places, in that you want to say, are you completed? Well, first you've got to look, have I taken a tail call? In which case, go and uh, here go and check that who I've tail call to, otherwise uh, otherwise, just get my resumption point and compare it to minus one. So when you do a move next, well, again, you've got to check the hijack, the tail call target. If you've, if you've done a move next, well, you, well, okay. So if you've done a tail call, well, then you look at the next one down the line and say, well, has it done a tail call as well? Okay, down here. Oh, and if it has, well, we can cut the middleman out. Okay, so you can eliminate these middle, if you've got chains of tail calls, you can eliminate the middle stack frames or the middle, they're not actually, you know, the middle coroutines. 
and then and, and chop them out like this. You, you, you make CR go directly to TG2, and then you do a move next. OK, so that uh, gives us, this is what implements um, tail call semantics in the sense that you can now have infinite chains of tail calls and all the middlemen will get uh, chopped out. And uh, then everything else is pretty much the same that you've seen. Uh, Coroutine state machine data is still, uh, well, it's got, it has so, it's got one interesting thing now, it's got the hijack target. So it has got some, you know, if you add, basically the rule of the game is if you add to the control structure, uh, like then you add to the state machine data, right? So if you add tail calls, then you add this hijack, you know, tail call target. Uh, and if you add a waiting, then you add a waiters and, 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 and so on, you'll see that play out. And otherwise, it's the same. We have a state machine. Uh, it is a little bit different in that that if your code doesn't finish, returns false here. So the code here returned false, returns false. Then you check to see whether we did a tail call. And if we did a tail call, well, we just jump directly to our tail call target. Okay. So uh, fine, everything else is the same. Uh, here is the tail call implementation where you're using return bang to indicate a tail call in this setting. And we simply, we just set the hijack target and we return false there and go back to the state machine. Okay. And so that lets us do the kind of thing we did before, test tail call. Uh, that's the example we started off with there. Okay. So yeah, so you asked so Chet is asking about the under underscore stack. Yes, now because this low level code, I I um this low level code is so important that I want to be able to write it out explicitly and know very clearly how it's going to translate across to .NET IL. Okay, this doesn't this the resumable code doesn't undergo an optimization phase. After it's done very late in the day, and so I want to be able to know exactly what we're getting. Okay, and um, and this is important because I expect the task implementation we have runs about five percent slower than C sharp, uh, and that's okay. Uh, totally respectable for 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 where we're at. Uh, I expect we'll be able to pick up that 5% through these micro optimizations to do with branch predictions and to do with uh, just the, the low level stuff of .NET code. And so it's very important to be able to write out this code uh, ex sort of explicitly. The problem is uh, we are doing a transformation here, which is that once you compose the code together, you've got to work out which variables are still available uh, after the yield points and it's the same transformation we do for sequence expressions and those things have to become fields in the state machine but this sort of stuff to do with the control logic does not it is um, it is purely stack allocated and I want to be able to specify it as being stack allocated and in a sense uh, having that uh, it's not checked by the compiler but it is enforced that this will never ever become a uh, a state machine variable and if it is, it gets zero initialized. And so there are plenty of places in this in, in these implementations where we are accessing, for instance, this stack fin here. Now we we do access that here after after some potential resumption points in this. So we are accessing that and we are accessing it down here. But it is definitely stack allocated. And this the spec the RFC says if we jump into the middle of the body, if we with the, we resume at the middle of the body. Well, anything that's stack allocated is zero initialized. So it is part of the spec of low level resumable code. Uh, and it doesn't apply to any other code in F sharp except resumable code. Okay. Right. Okay. So we're done resume with resumable. Resumable code. I think if you want the very micro example of making some resumable code and moving it, you can uh, do this little example. 
which is where the resumable code does nothing but set some field in the um, in, in, in state machine data. Uh, okay. Right. So go on and look at past so briefly. I think we have to look much at tasks. Uh, the, the by far, you've, you've seen this already. It's a, just a builder built on resumable code. We can, I guess, we can take a look at the implementation now, and it will start to be more familiar to you. So I'll skip down to the, uh, let's take a look at the data that a uh, task has compared to a coroutine. So uh, data, crucially it has this method builder thing, and this is following the C-sharp uh, way of, of code gen for tasks. You have to have one of these in order to build a task. Uh, the uh, it can have an awaiter in some situations and it, and it has a place to store the overall result for the task at the end of the day. Uh, okay, so let's take a look at the methods here. So task code is just resumable code carrying that kind of data in the state machine. So Things are very familiar. It's just resumable code <coughs> down here. Uh, the okay, but we add some primitives corresponding to what we added for the data. So, for example, if you try to return from another task, then if we're using resumable code, so if state machine compilation succeeds, then we get the awaiter, we check if the task is completed, if it is not completed, we yield, and you notice you can just use this resumable code.yield.invoke to kind of write low level code for a yield point, and then if we everything finished, then we either by immediate completion or by yielding completion, then we get the result out of the awaiter, we store it into the state machine, otherwise we call this await and so from completed. Okay, so with that we have a task builder and we can start to do things, except I skip over a whole lot of things, which is the point of biggest complexity for tasks is what you're allowed to bind to. And luckily we have this incredible work done by the F-sharp community on taskbuilder.fs and also apply. So taskbuilder.fs is our sort of starting point for tasks in F-sharp and it's a perfectly good usable implementation of tasks today. And you can see they have here, what can you bind with letbang? Uh, and they talk about tail calls uh, as well. Uh, now, um, now in C sharp, there's this big long spec of what, you, and it's built into the compiler about what you're allowed to await. And in taskbuilder.fs, what they did is they used the SRTP in F, in F sharp to characterize these patterns of what is and isn't awaitable. And so you can await tasks, of course, uh, but you can also await anything that has a configure await, get awaiter, uh, sorry, get awaiter is completed, get result. And this follows the C sharp. It's actually really good. With SRTP, we can just, it looks complex, but it's actually writing out what might be hundreds and hundreds of lines in the C-sharp compiler to, to define this pattern. And we get it in F-sharp just with SRTP and it's really nice. So we can use that with tasks. And let's look at the signature file for tasks. We use exactly the same spec. And this is all fine. Uh, so the key thing here is 
these uh, can what you can bind to and what you can return from. And it's exactly the same spec that you just saw uh, of using SITP to characterize the pattern. And it is, let's take a look. So we can actually look at the, the bind method. We've got two actual methods, return from and bind. And it says you have to have a can bind and you have to have a can return from. And then the, the can binds and can return froms up above characterize what you need on the types you're trying to try to work with. And it's fine. It's it looks complex, but it is very stable from task builder at this. And it is fine by me as a way of doing this. Uh, but Did we do any analysis of the code we generate in the sense of JIT friendliness? Uh, no, I w so we've done perf tests, but what I would love is if people took the current implementation and actually inspected the assembly code coming out and compared it with what C Sharp is getting. There's one particular area where we're going to be worse looking. Uh, I don't know if it translates to actual worse performance. Let me just go across to. Actually, I want to go to resumable NFS. So you'll you'll notice that resumable code here returns a boolean value to say whether it completed or not. Uh, so what C sharp does is they simply return from the method, uh, and uh, they. So we at, at the ends of the control structures, we tend to have this logic which says. Oh, did we did we return or not? If not, you know, just go to the end, go to the end, go to the end, and eventually you bubble out with a true or a false value. In C sharp, they tend to just be able to admit a return stru instruction straight away to like escape the whole thing. Uh, and it could be that to uh, we in practice, that's the kind of code that a modern microprocessor just doesn't care about because it's just immediately just jumping through with values. But it's possible we 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 suffer somehow from from that. Okay, uh, so you will definitely see that difference in the assembly code, but it's also other kinds of. Um, I, I just like people to, to to really compare like for like code with C sharp, and I'll start doing some of that myself. So Kevin also had a question, didn't mean. Uh, okay. It's okay, done. I figured that out. All right, good, good. Uh, but I do have another one now. Okay, okay. Well, Chad has asked, will builders in this style have a nicer stack frames error reporting? So there are yes, in the sense that you will get a single if you okay, so if state machine compilation succeeds, uh, then you know there is one move next method, one one struct with one move next method, which is immediately executed for any size of task. Okay. Uh, and that's really good. That that means you know you're your stack frames will kind of correspond much better to your code than a kind of a mess of closures, even if you're using try with and, and so on. Um, and it means that if you're resuming code, you'll be in the move next method from the from the resumption stack. So I mean, the code we get in the end is very much like the C sharp code. So I. Debugging looked okay to me, but we need to continue to proof that side of things and pin it down as well in test cases because it's. Uh, I, I have been pinning that down. Uh, we can start. To, we'll get to that in the test review, which we're probably not going to be able to do today. Okay. <clears throat> so I think um, you've seen all the. You know, there's this SRTP stuff has a, has a whole bunch of um, kind of stuff in the implementation. Uh, uh, I've been skipping over these dynamic implementations. In these dynamic implementations, um, I will uh, tackle this now. Uh, the so let's take a look at um, the dynamic. So if if state machine compilation is has failed. 
or we're using a quotation or something, then how, how on earth are we going to get this stuff to run? Well, we have this dynamic info here, which is normally null in the state machine, but uh, we'll probably be able to get rid of this field altogether from the generated structs, but it, it is present even for compiled state machines. But if, if state machine compilation fails, then we're going to be using this. And this thing here has a resumption func, which is a delegate very similar to the resumable code. Uh, make it a separate type because it has a very different role. And this represents the code of the state machine uh, in its sort of dynamic implementation where we haven't been able to inline and compose these resumption funks. And yeah, I mean, you can execute these things. You can execute them and just get a value. The question is, how do you resume them? Well, you can't resume them because you can't jump into the middle of them because we haven't expanded out the code. So we, in this case, we have to mutate this resumption func field every time we yield. So the dynamic implementations, uh, we can take a look at some examples. So the com in combine, oh, sorry, combine, the resumable code is really easy. We just, if, if, if state machine compilation succeeds and we compose everything up and we expand out this code, then we get a bit more of a .NET method where we run the code, we check the finish, we run the next code, otherwise we return false. There's an example of where we're bubbling up these false values. Here. Now, if we're doing dynamic, then it's a little bit different. Uh, and it's a lot more functional. Well, first we try to run the code, but if that didn't complete, so logically we're halfway through this code, but it will have registered the resumption function. And that's the thing. If something returns false, it's got to register a resumption function. And so we know there's a resumption function and we get it out and we say, well, actually, we've got to add to that continuation. We've got to after this thing completes, we've got to do some more work. We've got to do code. So after code one completes, we've got to do code two. So we pass it up to resume the resumption func. We make a new resumption func, uh, which says, oh, actually, you know, whatever code one needs to do, we continue running it. And uh, and then if it, oh, it's completed. Well, we'll do code two. And if it, and if it hasn't completed, well, we'll go back around the loop and we recursively res Chuck the resumption, chuck the the continuation, comes up the continuations for that resum whatever resumption function. So the way this is going to work is that code one is going to keep, you know, oh I haven't finished, but I've set the resumption function. Okay, okay. Then oh I do it again. Okay, adjust for it. I do it again. We adjust for it, and eventually we come out where we get to call move on to code two and continue. Uh, so it's it, it's a uh, it's not the prettiest implementation of continuation uh, passing or continuation mutating because uh, we're always mutating the continuation into here, but it does work. And it's good enough to mean that you can take quotations of tasks and you can execute them and uh, you can do reflective calls and things. And so that's fine by me. Uh, and probably the people who benefit most of that are the people who implement type providers, to be honest. Uh, type providers for returning tasks and so on. Uh, fine. So, right. Now we're going to have to look inside the compiler because there is some compiler work going on here. And I'm going to look at, start looking at the diff here because uh, we. Let's see, progress. Now, uh, there's actually the changes in the compiler are not that huge, so I will actually sort of scan through some of them. I've already looked at the F sharp core changes. Those. I've looked at tasks, so we can skip that. And we can look through. 
Uh, let's start here. Okay, so we're in the middle of ILX gen. So there's a very last phase of uh, generating IL code. And we hit an expression, uh, and we've still got those under, underscore state machine calls. And if you look at lower, uh, it's okay, so we're going to lower a state machine. And lowering is a terminology we use to mean we're going to get rid of that state machine construct and replace it with something else. And we get four different things back. One is that we got a, a group of information about how to generate a struct state machine. Okay, so that means state machine conversion succeeded, and we can go, go ahead and generate. Other is it says actually state machine compilation failed, but here's an alternative expression to use. So this is the dynamic implementation. Here's basically a set of calls we can use to uh, to as an alternative. And we issue, issue the warning, and we generate the expression. We say the state machine didn't work, didn't work out. You've used a let rec or something like that for some particular reason, and uh, uh, off we go. Uh, it's also the case where there was really no alternative to use because the user hadn't described the dynamic alternatives. Okay, and in that case, we actually give an error saying there is really no alternative and uh, bad luck. And otherwise, in the most common cases, we run this on every single expression, uh, and this it exits very quickly. It says, "Oh no, that wasn't a state machine," and uh, we continue on. Okay. So let's take a look at what it means to generate a state machine. So first of all, we get a whole lot of goop out of that result here. That is this lower state machine. Uh, this is a pattern match here where we're extracting all this stuff out. Uh, it's telling us here's the type the thing was based on. Here's the data the state machine is carrying. Here's the variables it captured. Here, they're all the different variables that represent the, this pointer, the SM values you saw. Here is the move next method. Here's the set state machine method, and here's the code to run afterwards. Okay, so we've got all of this from the state machine lowering, uh, and uh, and it's got its re resume ats have been eliminated. Everything has been eliminated, and we just simply go and generate a closure. We find uh, we find the three variables just like any closure in the compiler. Uh, and we do a bunch of code generation here on the various bits and pieces. We make some make the methods, we make method impulls, we make the fields for the for uh, the the state machine type, and we we get the fields for the captured variables. We make the type definition, and we've done we, we, we've done with that. And then we oh we do the after code down here. We um, allocate the uh, closure variables down here, and then we generate the after code here. So that's that. That's that. <coughs> uh, and so the other part we need to look at is lower state machines here, uh, which is, I'll just jump to the FSI file here. So this is what we just looked at. It's got a very simple, these are all the bits and pieces we're going to return. This is the only entry point, which is going to try to lower a state machine, and we get the result here. Look at lower state machine expression here, which says uh, check if it's a state machine, and if it's not, just return not a state machine. Otherwise, create a context here and apply it. Okay, and if we apply it here, we expand the state machine, uh, which gives us a move next, uh, so eliminates all the resumable code. Uh, actually, no, it doesn't. So this is what, where do we eliminate the resumable code? Uh, resume at. We might have. A re okay, so the move next is allowed to have a resume at. It's got some code. Uh, we have to expand out all the definitions of resumable code. We always do. So we uh, we look for where we've got let bind and say this code that you've got for this 
So the code is coming in for the task, and we define it out, we expand it out, uh, and then we convert out here, convert resumable code here. It's a two-phase operation because we have to decide. Uh, it's exactly the same process we use to sequence expressions, uh, unsurprisingly, and uh, then we phase one finds all the resumption points and uh, we get various generate various code labels for those phase two kind of commits everything so phase one has inside it the second phase and we get the final move next expression and then we add the resume at on the front uh, which is what which is basically adding the go to at the top of the method to jump to the resumption points and we rebuild the whole uh, the whole state machine and we return the result and we're done. And you can take a look at uh, the where was it? This one convert resumable code. Yeah. It's unsurprisingly recursive here. Uh, it, it keeps looking for definitions of new resumable code, the way things unfold. And uh, it and then these constructs here correspond to the specification of low-level resumable code in the RFC. That it can be a resume at, it can be a resume uh, a new a new resumption point, it can be an invoke of some other resumable code, it can be a sequential, it can be a while loop, it can be a try finally a low-level try finally, a low-level try with, and so on. And, uh, and then we convert through each of those. And then each of these are very similar in finding the resumption points and, and collecting up um, state variables and so on. Uh, exactly the same way we do sequence expressions that are based on the same, you know, so I'm, pretty, I'm confident the structure of this code is, 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 is good. Okay. And that is uh, pretty much the the implementation um, of everything. So if we um, if we look at the diff in the compiler, um, uh, we've got a little bit of change in check expressions. We can look at we have the resumable .fs and .fsi. We've got big changes. There are new files we've taken a look at. We have tasks, uh, two big files we've taken a look at. We've looked at ILX gen here. We've looked at lower state machines, big, big chunk of code there. And the last things we can look at are optimizer and post inference checks. The post inference checks checks resumable code, and the optimizer is uh, this inline if lambda feature, which we can look at in a moment. And everything else is just recognizing things. Uh, it just type tree ops. And that is it for the implementation. So we, we really have touched on pretty much everything. Now I want to talk about testing. Testing is obviously a lot to test here. Uh, we've got the uh, tests from this 1000 lines here is the tests from taskbuilder.fs. Uh, and that's great. There's lots of really good things tested in that. Uh, and they, they, they have all the same corner cases that we have. Uh, and then, uh, then we say, take those same tests and we run them using the dynamic implementation of tasks, uh, flushing out the same things there. Okay. Uh, let's just take a look. Okay, so there's two small RFCs combined with this, uh, which we haven't really talked about, though you've seen them along the way and you've probably seen them on Twitter or the like. One is inline if lambda. So this is where you can explicitly say that we saw it before that if this, this should be inline map here, that if this map uh, is inline and if this thing is a lambda, then this F will be inline at each of its call sites. We could just do that by default. Uh, some people are asking that, but I actually prefer that we make this explicit. Um, at least we, we, maybe we'll change on that once we get used to this. 
Uh, we did think about using this kind of syntax, but actually it's only in line if it really is a lambda value uh, as things get flattened. So I think it's okay to, to use the attribute here. Let's take a quick look at the, um, at the optimizer. This is not a particularly complex change here. Uh, the important thing here in line if lambda if lambda here, it's actually a very, very small change. We um, Uh, mm. Let's try and see what this. So, um, yeah, it's actually, it's, it's, it's a really, really tiny change. I'm actually find, struggling to actually find, find it. Maybe I'll talk about the other, the other RFC because um, most of this change is actually related to. Uh, the other fourth RFC is a tooling RFC about Lambda optimizations. And basically, it's specifying uh, a set of new optimizations in the F -sharp compiler, and it's always got to do with these computed function values. So where we let, uh, so we compute a function, and then we apply it. And uh, there are lots of cases, and this happens in computation expressions all the time. And there are lots of places where we were missing optimizations for 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 these. Uh, so that's most of what is in optimizer.fs is the set of those. And the comments in optimizer.fs should explain the optimizations. And we also optimize invokes of F-sharp delegates as well. That's, uh, that's necessary in this process of flattening out code. Uh, fine. Okay. Discussion. Uh, various debugging things uh, in the. Uh, how to tell what is the question, what is discussion here? Have we got particular questions? I think I'm not sure. Sorry, well, Chat, did I miss any particular questions in that? I think. Oh, Nina? I, I think between uh, Kevin chiming in, we hit most of the high points there. Uh, the key point is that things like uh, exception propagation is up to individual implementations of the resumable code feature or individual usages of the resumable code feature. Uh, that That's correct. Uh, yes, with the exception that those combinators like resumable code dot try finally will you know, putting the finally kind of semantics with the resumable on, on. Effectively, the point of those kind of combinators is to say we only implement things like the finally block on the on the we return true paths on the false paths we just drop through without executing the finalies. Yeah. Well, um, there is still the issue uh, or the question that was asked by Kevin earlier in the call around uh, inlining debug information and what it actually means for being able to debug your own uh, code that runs inside of a resumable code builder. Right, yes, this actually is, um, it's important. Uh, so the, the um, when the F-sharp compiler inlines code, it associates 
all of the code with the range mark of the place where it's being inlined to. Okay, and um, and this can be a problem uh, uh, because there may be several phases involved in the resumable code. For, uh, for instance, a try and a final, for example. And um, so the, the implementation does include a couple of hacks and they're documented here to make sure we get a better sequence point for in these particular cases or in particular this in this in this case the aim we're in the the resume code for try with what was happening before is that the the debug point is where this try with is actually associated with the try of the computation expression and so the with code is actually kind of in the debugger was jumping back to the try and you don't want that okay you just want to go through to the with code and so this actually is uh, a spec is a there's a hack in the remark expression which 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 rewrites the ranges to the source range to the inlining point in the compiler to say actually just don't do it in these particular cases and it's, it's under test uh, but it is a hack uh, I don't yeah and you know it, it's, a, it's a problem with inlining. What we should really do, logically speaking, in a sort of purist kind of world, is kind of pass in several debug points as parameters and be able to specify, uh, you know, one for the try and one for the with, and be able to specify sort of an under underscore debug point or something like that. Uh, and then everything will be nice and easy because you just kind of rewrite and flow the information through and get the right debug point. But the, the F sharp inlining mechanism doesn't have that debug friendly um, feature so you know the, we have a we have a hack in there to to get the right debug point uh, yeah so that is what it is um, I, uh, we could fix that separately uh, I think it would, it would be an orthogonal fix um, if we look at type tree ops and look at the diff in here then that is uh this is mostly this up the important part is in here which is remark expression just do remarks when the lambda gets in land and it the important case is here we find detect this this big long nasty comment about this special thing we're doing in this code here to actually you can even see the particular hack i'm using here to really detect just that particular case and i i don't know how to do that without putting in a yeah, I mean, I know how to do it in a principled way. I just described it, but it's a whole separate feature to extend F sharp inlining with this kind of debug friendly information. And I'd rather do it all at once because there are many, many things that can benefit from that. There are many um, DSLs which could benefit from two phase DSLs which can benefit from this. Uh, so, uh, I guess try and break it would be my first request to everybody. Uh, check out the branch or when it goes into preview, you know, if the debugging is not right, we can play this kind of hack to improve it. Uh, it's hard to get the stuff right, I guess. It's a, it's a point, but this is, is what it is, and we make sure it's under test. We, we should do a separate session since we're running out of time. We should do a separate session for a test review, I think. I have a different question. Yeah. Um, after uh, one has compiled an, um, an app or a library that makes use of this resumable um, code, is any of the runtime um, behavior dependent on a specific version of F-sharp core, or is it 
entirely compiled. So that's uh, if you just write a task, it is entirely compiled, and there should be absolutely no uh, reference to even any of the F# -sharp core features. And in fact, I believe today you could actually check out this branch, use the F# -sharp compiler you get, and run it on top of F# -sharp .core, uh, the previous, the current published public version, and everything will just work. There's no, uh, there's so you can literally use this F# -sharp compiler to to make F# -sharp 5.0 compliant code. Uh, there's no. Uh, I guess there's a chance you're inlining data uh, if you if if your own task code is marked inline and it will it will it will of course refer through to F# -sharp core things. But no, it's really very much flatten out compile uh, kind of feature. That's great. That's great. We should do all our features this way. Uh, yeah, that's all right. It's inline f We've got a we've got something in the compiler to inline f sharp dot core, don't we? Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, but the types they pass for uh, libraries exactly. that require different things. So that's right. That's right. But there are no all those types I've shown are just runtime types. Even the struct type uh, gets copied. Um, I guess actually. Uh, uh, probably, actually, that struct type that you're generating does still have that resumption field, a resumption func field for the dynamic info. That's probably referring to f sharp core now. I think about it. So there will, yeah, there'll be there'll be a bit of residue. But Is there that, any yeah. chance that we could generate a local version of that guy? No, we can remove that field because it's not used as the set of and we should uh, for, for performance reasons. Um, it's just life is so much nicer done if we don't couple. Oh, I think realistically, the, the I mean, because the compilation, just the way our compilation chain is set up, no one's actually going to run on previous f -sharp core because we'll just end up. So we will have. There's no way. It, it, uh, it's not worth. I mean, I was that was more. Uh, yeah, yeah. Decoupling might be possible. I'm sure. I'm sure of that. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, so. Um, are there more questions? I want to show the list of issues uh, that Nino um, got, came up with in the Slack discussion with Nino. Uh, I've marked them in the RFC at the bottom. Uh, uh, so one is Ply has a V task for generating value tasks. That uh, uh, which require no allocation, but are very you might say dangerous to use. Uh, you might have to box them manually yourself afterwards if they didn't complete. Um, so this thing is definable from the outside. I'm sure it is. Uh, you just have. Uh, you you might. It's not. Yeah. We we yeah. Uh, we discussed that as well, because you need to use a different uh, async method builder under the that's hood. That's and, and that, right. That's yes. Thank that's you the, for the, that. So the bit of code that, that you can that yeah, you, straight away you can be fine uh, Okay. Uh, that's a called async value task. It's something. Okay, so I think if you replicate so, task.fs to vtask.fs, replace those things, value task method builder, and change the after code to in, simply return a value task, then I think you're good, aren't you, Nino? Yeah, in imply, we actually build task on top of value task. It, it comes okay. with a little bit of a, a yeah, performance decrease. 
but it's yeah. worth it in terms yeah, of. No, no, I, 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 yeah. I can, I, I can see that would be natural. Now, so there's a question of from a design perspective: Do we want VTask in the? Personally, I find value task is a dangerous thing from the F# perspective. It's something people will hang themselves on. They don't know what's going on. I've hanged myself on value task. So, so that's new so? Don't. Sorry, say that again. I said, how so? There is it's, oh, because it's the, dot, just the, dot, the dot result is not a does not wait, right? You can raise an exception. Uh, no, it does. It does. Uh, okay, didn't for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that uh, shouldn't happen. We, we, we can look at that. Uh, my. Actually, there are cases. It's it's actually just a very light wrapper around uh, either the T or uh, a task most of the time. Uh, maybe I can right. Right, I found it was necessary to do this, you know, that a value task is not completed, then the value task dot result raises an exception. And if it, uh, so you actually have to do it as task dot result. Have you found that? Um, this, this may be because there is a value task source underneath. I'll have to check. Yeah, but that's, that's a good point. Okay, so I found them dangerous use. So I, I'm not uh, in love with value tasks as part of the F sharp task programming model, but that's because I, you know, maybe especially if you know the people into performance can get can can make that trade off themselves separately by referencing you know, F sharp dot core dot value tasks or something as a separate DLL. Uh, and I, so to me, it doesn't. Quite make the cut into F sharp dot core as being necessary for, or it is something we can add later. Uh, so at least for um, preview feature, I'm happy not to having that. Uh, you know, the, the, when we make when we put in V task, it really becomes absolutely in every possible to do value task in every point of every. It's open by default, you know. I mean, we could make it not open by default, I guess. We could make it you know, open at sharp.core or control or value tasks or something. Uh, sort of start playing those sort of things. Uh, I might be happy with that. Uh, I just don't really want them, like, I don't want value delegates or value you know, th th things. I don't know, just things which are, don't really fit functional pro expression oriented programming in quite the same way. Okay. But your experience is different and I'm listening to that. Uh, we did we can re remove this. I've mentioned that uh, we need to keep working on checking the stack traces beyond the testing we have. Uh, so it's particularly important to make sure we do lots of testing for where, what happens after there's been a yield of some kind uh, in a task. To make sure stacks are good, then to make sure debug breakpoints get hit and everything. Ply has a whole lot of tests we can lift over. Probably the, the most important immediate testing thing. Uh, we want to check the generated assembly code for performance. Uh, and now, and the only design point uh, I'm really concerned about is that we can't yet bind to IA sync disposable. And the current proposal is that we overload the use syntax in computation expressions. So you'd, you'd be able to use so task use a resource equals um, some IA sync disposable thing. Um, dot 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 and this so this will map down to task sorry task interface using 
then we will overload this on both I disposable and I sync disposable. And you have to do a hack where one of these will take a default, uh, take a take an extra parameter uh, with a default argument in order to make that possible, but we can do that. Uh, so anyway, that's the current proposal, but it's not yet done. In fact, probably try and do that tomorrow just to get it uh, design complete. Um, did you want to put more things on the list from Ply? This, uh, this should cover it, I'd say. Yeah. 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 So we did talk about whether it's possible to implement tail calls for tasks. Um, and it's not. Uh, it's task. It's very unfortunate. But uh, if you look at what do we mean by that? Here is it with ta so it's the same thing as with task builder. It says you should use a while loop like this rather than doing a return bang on a recursive task here. So um, I'd love to be able to do that tail call cutout hack that we're doing for, uh, I showed in coroutines to get tail calls for tasks. We do it for tail calls for sequences already. Uh, if, we, if we want to see where we do that, here is in seek core.fs in f sharp .core. We uh, The f sharp compiler generates a, an i enumerable. It generates it as a subtype of uh, generated sequence base. And you can see these two fields here, redirect to and redirect, uh, represent the tail call cutout thing uh, for sequences. Okay, very similar to the coroutine design pattern that I showed before. And you can see the hacks where we uh, redirect, redirect to, and so on. It's the same, log logically the same thing as I was showing before. Uh, now, I would love to be able to do that for tasks here, but the problem is it, it can't be done with all that tasks. It's really unfortunate. All we need to really do is set a bit on a task saying F sharp created this, but we can't do that. Uh, and I might talk to um, to the .NET people because it would be nice to get this solved in the, in the long run. If, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. okay. So, tail calls. Uh, okay, any more? Questions or comments? I could. There are other things I could cover, but I, I, I more want to spend. We've gone a bit over time. We'll just spend five minutes just saying anything you want, anything you need to be able to go and do a more detailed review of what's in there. Uh, anything uh, you want? Any questions at all? Anyone? New one game. Okay, no takers. Chuck, Philip, Vlad, Tina, Kevin, anyone? Any guess? Okay, so uh, if you want to try things out, uh, you can go to the pull request. Let me just find that pull request number again. 6811 is the magic number. You can try things out. I guess since you all, uh, you didn't uh, take advantage of the opportunity, I guess we can talk about performance just for a moment. Uh, you can, okay, so the, the you can, when you build things, you'll notice that a thing called task perf gets built. So it's in test slash F sharp 
perf task slash and it's in the F sharp directory because you have a, uh, uh, a corresponding thing. It's in task perf dot fs proj here. And it contains various tests of computation expressions. It contains the two coroutine implementations. It contains an asynchronous sequence implementation. It also contains task builder. We could also chuck ply in here, Nino. I'd love if you could do, if you wanted to do that and just put in the matching code. And then it runs the same, logically the same tests for all these different things, plus also does these ones to do with the other computation expression builders. And that's all. Um, so you can play around with this. You can run the performance test yourself. You can look at the generated assembly code in the context of this, compare it to other other C sharp implementations and so on. It's a good place to do it. Uh, these are the sort of performance results where we're we're just comparing C sharp tasks, our task. So this is uh, F sharp task, and also task builder. See, task build is actually really fast. Okay, so you know it's actually really good today. Uh, so these are the important ratios. Uh, we're always just looking at this figure here for how wet the task is doing. The task build is pretty good, but you can see we're seven percent off for that example, six percent off for that, four percent off for this, nine percent off for a single synchronous task, uh, and um, then the rest of the rest of the stuff is testing other things to do with lists and arrays and computation expressions, but those are the core task things. Hey, John, quick yeah. question here. Um, as I was sort of naively looking through this chart a little earlier, I noticed, um, I think it was the list builder, new builder test case yes. as like a 2.x multiplier in terms it, of ratio that, to our baseline. That's right. So exactly. So this, um, to give context, uh, one of the, things we ended up looking at is, is doing efficient list builders and list builders aren't really part of the RFCs we're reviewing today though the set of optimizations are related to making sure we can make efficient list builders which is why more efficient list builders now in um, I'll show you the code that's being compared so here okay so there are list expressions in F sharp that do computation, and this is the this is an alternative implementation of a list builder, so that uh, you can then do this kind of thing. Okay, instead of using the normal square brackets, you can just use curly brackets with the C at the front, and everything else is the same. And it does it a different way of constructing the list as things go. And the test cases we're comparing are uh, doing a variable size list. Okay, so there's the, the of size five or six or 10. Uh, and this is comparing it to the existing way of doing that for the, the compiler emits. Okay, and the doing a fixed size list. Okay, and then we do exactly the same things for array.fs the same games with arrays and uh, da, 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 da. and you can see you've got a fixed size array versus uh, using the new builder or versus a uh, a fixed size here so if we go back to look at the performance tests you can now understand what we're comparing so if we're doing a, oh, there's another test case for the tiny one. So in, the, in a tiny variable size list where we alternately return zero or one elements, okay, then the new builder is actually massively faster. Okay. Uh, for the variable size list, six or 10, the new builder is actually a lot faster, but it's these fixed size cases where we're turning out slower. And that is of course the, the fixed size case has a special optimization in the F sharp compiler. Uh, so you can't just naively substitute, you know, remove all the square brackets in your code and put in list curly bracket. Your, your code won't always run faster because a lot of those are going to be fixed size cases. And for arrays, that's even more dramatic. We're faster, we're faster. And the fixed size case, as you can guess, allocating a fixed size array and filling in the values is, is very, very fast. Uh, whereas if there's any chance it's going to be a variable size, 
which the computational expression has to deal with, then it, then there's a, a resize array is needed in between. And so in short, um, this is why you're getting those cases and why those things aren't part of the RFC. Okay, the ability to create those things is part of the RFC, but uh, they're not. We're not modifying those in the F# -sharp compiler. That will be done separately. We'll maintain the fixed size optimization. Uh, we also check an option builder, uh, and this is all just done through inlining and flattening of the code and the optimizations that get applied. And you can see the option builder ends up in some cases a value option builder ends up about twenty times or 10, 10 times faster. Uh, and finally, the task seek implementation, which is quite a beast of a thing, and I'm incredibly glad we don't have to code gen this thing. I can't believe the C# -sharp compiler does this. But if you look at what the uh, what data a task uh, I think enumerable state machine has to carry, then it can carry. This is what the C# -sharp compiler does. It carries all of these th things here. This is based on the generated C, C -sharp code, and. Uh, Pretty much, and um, and it's 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 a big load of stuff that they see that they do, and uh, yeah, I, I, it's fine. It is what it is. But this ultimately, we will do a separate RFC to put Isaac enumerable into F# core. It will be based on this implementation, which looks pretty robust to me. Uh, and its performance results are not yet where we want them to be. It's still 50% off C sharp, but it is 20 times faster than async seek. So um, it's still going to be pretty, pretty good. We can, uh, one of the reasons this is a bit slower is it supports tail calls. It also does disposal a little bit differently. It does, uh, the, it does disposing through this disposal stack of things, finally, to run when um, the, 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 the async enumerable gets disposed. And um, this is fine. It's a very simple implementation. It's a lot. And the particular test case I'm running is actually really stressing, stress testing them, is nested for loops. Uh, so, so we're pretty close to having a full task a seek implementation um, drop drop out of this work as well, but uh, it won't be part of um, F sharp dot core. But yeah, we're, we're, we're pretty pretty well on the way to that. Any other questions? Since we're out of time, maybe just one on inline if lambda. Yep. Uh, what was your uh, your idea on the on the name there, like what? Why well, why, why the if lambda part? Well, because oh, because you can pass in a function value, right? yeah, and you yeah. won't inline. You know, if so, let, let me just give an example of that. Uh, okay, uh, So uh, if, if, even if I have inline if it's also so it's a map function and uh, okay, so if gets called even say uh, say say it actually gets called twice. Uh, which is, uh, then I can call, uh, I can write a new function, g, uh, thing, do something uh, g is map, so the identity function, like that. No, I'm going to pass in some f, map f. Uh, and so, because this, and even I could put a no inline attribute. There's a, there's a, there is a, an F sharp. There's some you know, magic JIT thing you can do to say really never, ever, ever inline this. Don't even let JIT inline it. And then F really isn't isn't known, and you got no inlining going on or anything. So the if lambda is really honest. Uh, I think it's misleading to use inline here, right? 
It's just, I mean, not the end of the world if we did. I actually did look at it when just using the keyword, but it hits a bunch of technical difficulties. It didn't make it seem worthwhile. And this seems pretty honest to what's going on. As a, what do you think, Nina? It's a bit bulky, but I, I agree. I, I understand why it's why it can't always inline, but uh, for the non SRTP functions today, this this can happen uh, as well. So maybe yeah, there's one, maybe you can also already shorten the name. I'm not sure. Uh, this, well, this there's is, another reason not to use if lambda, which is the attribute's actually useful on on values like say integer values. Doesn't mean you can inline any expression because it might have a side effect. Uh, but any, um, yeah, there are cases where we could, yeah. Problem is that, I mean, that it doesn't in general work because if you call twice with a, with something with a. It, what looks like an integer expression, but it actually has a side effect like with A5 or something like that. And of course, you're not going to, and this is C, and we're doing C plus C. Okay, then um, of course, we don't, it would be semantically, you know, this is not a macro system, right? We're not actually going to substitute. This. It's it's this. all it's also no call by name or that kind of. Uh, it's not exactly. It's not call by name. It's it's so in line of lamb, lambda values, of course, can be copied around and without side of getting side effects. So, so it just means when the point I'm making there is that although we only apply it to lambdas at the moment, we could also in future apply to any object construction which doesn't have identity, which doesn't have side effects. Uh, any value construction. And so there are reasons why we might want to take the if lambda off, but I'm still not, I'm still just not happy with, with well, this. Well, I'm fine with the attribute. Let's, yeah, let's be clear on that. Okay. So if it's, if it's uh, an attribute called inline, then I'd say that also fits the bill. Uh, oh, maybe oh, maybe if lambda just makes it too uh, too specific. Uh, well, the thing is, it makes it searchable Not today. But today, it's uh, very the thing scary. is, inline if lambda makes it searchable to distinguish between the inline keyword. Yeah. So I do feel we need something. You've got to be able to Google this to find out what's going. Yeah, we uh, wouldn't want to. We wouldn't want to use the good name on this. Yeah, I I maybe not. I think. I think Later on, on we'd have to. Yeah. Later on, we'd have to figure out how to get around having already used the good name. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty, it is actually quite a powerful feature for for forcing flattening of code, definitely. You know, because in fact, you can do this kind of thing, or even this, to be honest. Uh, you, you can kind of write loop unrollings and things like that. Uh, yeah, uh, people do this stuff with SRTP already today, but uh, okay. Guilty, yeah. Yep, yep. You do that. Uh, uh, there's there's one thing that I uh, that I missed when uh, when you asked earlier on if the whole list was complete. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should also look at the attributes we but. I think it will come up in the stack trace analysis because there are some some hacks in the runtime for detecting the iasync state machine frame when it comes out of the uh, execution or exception dispatching info. Um, okay. So it can remove the um, uh, yeah, what's that called? The the boundary, the mm -hmm. and um, it only triggers if the frame comes from an iasync state machine move next method and the mm -hmm. type that implements it uh, has the compiler generated attribute on it. So there is a few of these kind of uh, Interesting. So, intricacies. Uh, let's take a look. Um, Mm 
this. So you want to go to a typical um, so so task here and it is calling task for help is ten lines sync task. Sync task. Yeah, you can see the difference there. You see that the async, F sharp async code, it's in deep debug mode, but look at that, it generated one, two, three, four. Look at all those closures that we're generating there. This one generates one closure. Yeah. I'll show you the actual source code for this. Uh, task Sync task or async, but that's the sort of code we're running. So the async one generated loads and loads of closures. Okay, whereas this code gets flattened and crunched down to one new next method. Oops. Right, so here's the task and here's the move next method. Right, so you're saying it's got it. Could you run through that again? You know what it's got to be. Yeah, it, 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 this this looks fine, but I, I think it's just missing the compiler generated attribute on the oh. on on the struct. I think um, is what it is. The struct. It could be that it's there. Uh, right. Interesting. I would have thought we put that on most. Um, Closure classes. Interesting. Why well, we don't do that? Uh, I also uh, oh. added the link to uh, apply in the in the comments, and mm. it brings you to an implementation I did, which okay. also has the link to. I'm not sure if it's current anymore. It's a core CLR link, I see. Ah, it's to the commit that that actually did this. Okay, yeah, that'll give you enough information. Yeah, that's the one. Okay. So in there, you see the uh, the PR that introduced this this hack. Okay. Oh, but, and, and, and you do that by? Yeah, so um, here I have two implementations. And yeah, uh, so that's the, that's the core CLR PR. And then, so you have the iSync state machine implementation and you have uh, compiler generated on the, on oh, the actual awaitables in my case. Got it, got it, got it. okay. Yeah. Cool, I'll, I'll have a look. That's super important. It's just so much easier to do. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Yes, Brandon. Yes, that's right. The F sharp async code uh, had has bad 
if it was the debug version of the code, which really generates loads of uh, loads of closures. It's a nice programming model, but it's it's bad. But one of the uh, one of the unknown things here, uh, I, I'm pretty is a can can you re-implement the F sharp async model uh, using Zumba code? I mean, I don't think we're going to get bug for bug compatibility with F sharp core async. Uh, so I think the fshop.com one will probably have to stay like it is. Uh, but when you think about it, um, all you need is tail calls. You need multiple. You've to multi-start them, start them as many times as you want. But we already do that for task sequence, so we've already got examples of doing that. And uh, you need to pass the cancellation token implicitly, uh, which can be done uh, in the in the state machines. And so I think you can get something with the, the effectively the F sharp async programming model and with nice task interrupt uh, through through this. And I'd imagine we'll do that from the outside. There will be a community library of some kind, which would be like F sharp async two or something like that, uh, or son of async. Uh, personally, I find it a, a nicer programming model. So. It'll be a little. It'll be a little bit slower because there are overheads to tail calls and there are overheads to multi-start, and over and a little bit of overhead for cancellation token passing. But uh, it it is a nicer programming model. Okay, state machine. Ah, uh, see. Thank you. Oh, this is in the course here. Uh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, specifically the the other link chat posted is more relevant. Okay. It's it's to the same file, but the line number is is different. Um, Nina, could you review uh, what we do with exception dispatch info? Like we're not doing anything in task.fs, particularly with EDI. Do we no. need to be? No, it's um, it's actually task that does this uh, through the yeah. You call get result, and get result either throws an okay. exception. Yeah. And, uh, and then it then it stores it again as an EDI on the on the next task. That's all it does. Uh, okay, that's fine. But uh, what I want to what I'm wondering about is these cases for try finally. Right. Is, okay. Where we save the exception onto the stack uh, uh, and we we throw it. So. Uh, so we have a re-raise there, which should be fine. Uh, okay, so that should be fine. Try with, try with, try with the catch and uh, and invoke the with. Yeah, no, I guess it's fine. How, how, does no. the re how does the re-raise work? Is it a custom implementation that does an EDI? So otherwise, it's not valid. It may not be valid. Re-raise is the re-raise. Uh, there's a special thing in F-sharp you're allowed to use in with blocks that just is the .NET IL re-raise instruction, so it does the right thing. So if, if you look uh, in C-sharp code, I'm not sure that they actually uh, also use the same, M maybe. Um, because once you're, um, yeah, you're inlining everything. Because yeah, so then it then it may be all right. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's okay. Yeah, in the in the closure case, you're you're not on the same frame, so you can't just suddenly call the the IL version. On the right. Right. Well, you've jumped into the into the yeah, frame. Exactly. It's okay. Yeah. 
Okie dokie. Uh, let's finish up. We're way over time. It always goes over time. But, uh, thank you so much for everyone for coming. I hope that's helped guide what you need. Uh, if there's anyone else who'd like to say anything, please dive in. Otherwise, it's been great to have you all and look forward to many comments. And please go over this one really carefully. It is low level stuff. It's, got to, it's not like this test itself when you type into the IDE, right? You know, there's something about the string interpolation, which I was very happy with what we did. But, you know, you literally see any problems immediately in the IDE, especially with tooling and the like. There's not much tooling involved in this, apart from debugging and the like. Please check this whole thing carefully. And uh, yeah, be much appreciated. Cool. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Tom. Pleasure. Thanks, everyone who Bye. came and stayed silent. Uh, all the people on the background, but it's great to have you along. Hope that helps.